So, uh, hello. Yes, as you know, I'm Rachel. Uh, I'm, I'm not one much for lectures, so I'm not going to lecture. Um, you're probably all also very familiar in general with the concepts behind sustainability and behind food systems. So I don't want to um, beat us over the head with those things. But uh, so uh, I'll try to go a little bit more into the complexity, some of um, my own kind of learning and perspective from, from my research and really just try to give us a bit of an overview that's both nuanced but accessible. So I'm going to start off with one of my favorite um, activities, which is to just have you yell things at me, which is great. So it gets us saying that I, I'm not up here, I don't know everything by far, you probably all know much more than me in many ways. So. But what I'd like to do is start off with this um, food literacy show. So many of you are probably also really familiar with many of these things. And what I'd like to do, I'm going to show you an image of something. And all I want you to do is just say to me what that image is. Now I recognize that um, you probably have many non-native English speakers and it's okay if you know the word in your language or in some other language then we can, uh, of course, this is very acceptable. And um, then we'll learn it in English together. Uh, so. I just want you to shout. You may know some things, you may not, but, okay. So, starting. I heard it. Yeah, the cells. Okay, we know this one. What about this one? Pepsi. Pepsi, good, we're getting the vibe. We're getting the flow here. What are these? Beans. But what kind of beans? It's a very good question. Red beans is not far from the truth. You know, I might know. Sorry. Cranberry. Cranberries, close, close to cranberry beans. Actually, quite reminiscent, similar variety. In English, they're called scarlet runner beans. So this is a specific type of really fun bean. But yes, they're beans. Hesperger. Okay, we know this one. What are these circled things? They're sprouts. Yes, they're potato sprouts, and and in English we call them eyes. So they're the eyes of the potato. Yes. Yeah, that's a fun one. Um, so we know those. That's good. What are these? Can we see this over here? Maybe. Is it that thing that grows on the bottom of the boat? It is not a barnacle, but that's a good guess. It doesn't grow on the bottom of boats. Anyone have a general guess for the category of thing it might be? I think it's a seed. But it is a seed. Very good. Does anybody know what kind of seed it is? Not but did anybody have one of the snacks? It's a banana seed. Anybody ever seen a banana seed? No. Why haven't we seen a banana seed? Does anybody know why we don't see banana seeds? Because we have real bananas that don't have seeds anymore. Because we have a, almost every single banana you've ever touched in your whole life, if you eat bananas, um, is a seedless variety. It's a clone. So it's a clone of the same single Cavendish um, variety of bananas. And uh, right now, they're only cloned for mass production. There are many different types and varieties of bananas, but we only eat and mass produce one. And this is a seed that we never see. How about this one? It's quite zoomed in, of course. Apple seed. Very nice. An apple seed, exactly. Also a seed, one that we see a lot more, because most of the apples we eat still come with seeds. These letters are significant of something. Do we know what, what they mean? We probably our gardeners in, and agricultural students in the group know. Exactly. So nitrogen, potassium, and phos phosphorus and potassium are the, the three. And what are they important for? Why, why are they important letters? They're the Right, for growing plants, yes. These are the main and often three living nutrients in soil that plants often need to grow. Usually when you're looking at fertilizing your plants, whether it be naturally or synthetically, you want to understand the balance of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in your soil. That's an important piece. So when you buy, for example, synthetic fertilizers, they usually have an NPK number, which is a ratio of these three elements, these three chemicals together. And they also naturally occur, so they don't need to be bought. 
What's this thing? Yeah, yes, it's a combine harvest. What does it harvest? Wheat. Different grain. Not wheat. Corn. It's a corn harvester. So uh, I grew up in the Midwest, United States, and we have a lot of corn harvesters. And this is um, a kind of wild machine that goes through the fields and just sort of combs up the corn and shucks it and puts it in the back and out comes those kernels like in the other picture. So this whole, this thing does all of it. It takes it from the ground, processes it, rips off all the leaves and sh then takes the corn and you just get the little corn kernels out. So I didn't. Uh, what's, what is this one? It says on it, it is glyphosate. Does anybody know the common name for glyphosate? Roundup. Roundup. We heard of Roundup? Roundup is a specific type of, um, pesticide and herbicide um, that is sprayed, it's an herbicide actually, so it's just for killing weeds, it's a weed killing um, chemical that a lot of the corn in the United States is specifically, it's not, it's not actually allowed in Europe I don't think, but we use this in the United States to get rid of the weeds in our cornfields because our corn is usually a genetically modified to be able to be Roundup resistant. So they have what's called Roundup ready corn. So the corn doesn't die if you spray it with glyphosate, but everything else does. So that's what this one is. This is a fun one. Okay, well, just a few more, I, I promise. Um, what are all of these things? Big words, but it's a category of things. We're going for the category here. General group. Exactly. They are food additives, particularly additives for what purpose? Preserve. Usually to preserve the shelf life, the integrity, and the flavor of the foods that we ship often long distances or we keep packaged on shelves. These are food additives. There are many, many, many of these. Um, what's this one? Spread on a petri dish, it's a bacteria, exactly. It's a common bacteria found on food. I can tell you this. Yeast. You've probably heard of it. Um, yeast is a good guess, but not quite. Yeast is another type of microorganism. Um, what are we, what's something uh, that we like to wash our greens for? We want to make sure we wash our greens because we don't want to get food poisoning, which is caused by E. coli? Anybody heard of E. coli? Yeah, that one. This is what it looks like when it's um, grown in a lab. Not on your uh, spinach. Um, okay, what are these things? Now this is a special, uh, like if anybody gets this, I'm going to be really pleased. There are types of preservatives, but there's a specific um, connection among all of these different types of, well, preservatives, uh, flavoring, and additives. They're, they're sweeteners, often sweeteners, and they are all products derived from corn. Mm. Now again, um, in Europe, this is another kind of little side worry because there's not a lot of corn, particularly in Finland, there's not a lot of corn being grown for use in human food, particularly, um, or additives in this sense. But at least in the United States, about 70 to 80% of the products that are in a grocery store have one of these corn additives. We could say corn is king, corn dominates the grocery stores, the food options available to most modern consumers. Um, because we have so many different things we can make from corn, and we have a very large corn lobby which allows us to grow cheap corn and process it into all of these things. Um, what's this one? I think I have like three left, I promise. Some corn. <laughs> yes, yes, it is the ancient ancestor of corn called Teosinte. This is what um, Mesoamericans had initially found and domesticated to grow in through the intermediates and into modern corn, which is fascinating. This is a really interesting uh, human produced change over a relatively short period of time to create a food product, and this is often how much of the food that we eat now in mass, often our staples, started off as some very obscure variety that we found the best kinds, and we continued to grow the, the best ones and kind of domesticate them. So similarly with rice, and with wheat, and with um, 
most fruits, actually. We just continue to, to kind of grow them in a, in a way that we can domesticate them. Okay, thank you for, for bearing with me through all of that. So, um, what did you notice throughout this process? What surprised you? What didn't surprise you? Remember, this isn't a lecture. I don't want to lecture. That we know more about brands than <laughs> the food we eat or mm, what okay. we do. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so you recognize the brands, yeah. right? Like Hesburger and McDonald's. Okay. What else? That we don't know the other form of food that we're eating than the thing that we see in the supermarket. Mm, exactly. So we know what's accessible to us, right? Maybe we didn't know the seeds. We didn't know what a tomato seed looked like. But we knew um, what McDonald's was, and there's tomatoes, ketchup, and like everything, right? Um, it's it's interesting. But why why is that? Of course, it's available to us, and it's what someone spends a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort getting us to know. So someone somewhere, some ones, had this job of coming up with what it is that's going to capture our attention and get us to remember this thing. They don't spend a lot of time getting us to remember what tomato seeds are. They spend a lot of time getting us to think about and remember and buy McDonald's and Pepsi and Coca-Cola and Hesburger and all of these things, right? They also don't want us to spend a ton of time thinking about the other things that are in our food. So you look at the back and you think, wow, that's a lot of ingredients. You don't really think about it because it's easier not to, right? And they don't spend a lot of time often, because there's a lot of money to be made in getting us to think about what's in our food. So, kind of point of this exercise is that there's a lot of things going on. And we also have a lot of behind the scenes aspects. We also didn't know exactly like the chicken deep beaker, the layers versus broiler egg, right? So these are some kind of behind the scenes things that unless you're involved in the process, which a lot of us are no longer very involved in our food systems at the production level, we don't know a lot of those things. Um, it's uh, very different, or if you don't ever see mass monocrops, you don't necessarily understand how corn is harvested and how it's sprayed for Roundup to kill all the weeds, right? There's this whole other, that, granted that doesn't happen in Europe, so you're doing all, already very well. Um, but anyway, so this is the kind of idea of food literacy, and I like to start with that um, because as food literacy, I think it's really important for us as an individual to understand where we are, where we're situated. So this idea of food literacy is basically how much of the, the way in which food is made and processed, packaged, consumed, how much of it do you know, how much of it you're aware of, and in that case, the more you know, the more you can actually have some input on it or how we can take our, our individual kind of intersectional space in the food system and do something with it when we know where we're coming from. So again, this is considering all of those aspects and the complexities within food systems. So, um, thinking about our food literacy today, you just coming to this sort of course, you being aware of these things is already kind of heightening our food literacy and having these sorts of conversations. So, um, I'm going to talk just now briefly a little bit about food systems in general, the complexities and the parts, and you probably know many of these things. The whole idea of this food literacy shot was for us to get to think about all these different aspects that we don't normally think about the things that we aren't seeing on a daily basis. So I hope that already kind of helped to broaden some of your, your feelings and thoughts on where you're situated in the food system. So um, a kind of really general and um, very widely accepted overview of food systems are these sort of spheres of, of consumption and spheres of production that are interconnected. And they're interconnected in many ways, of course, in that the food we consume is coming from the production side, but then there's a lot of interacting pieces. Um, and within all of those, we have to remember that there are many other spheres of influence. So the farmers, our farmers are dealing with a lot of things. They're dealing with the economic challenges. They're dealing with the technology, the harvesters, the chemical applications for their food systems, for their food, for the food production. Also the, the science and technology aspect around that, the development of new varieties of um, pork so you can grow better pigs and better bacon, whatever. They're dealing with all of these things. Um, as on top of all of that, the geopolitical relations, the way the world is all interconnected these days, that it's um, kind of this, these spheres of influence. Um, so there's, 
there's a lot going on here. And then us as consumers, of course, we have a lot of embedded values and knowledge and preferences that come into play. So it then also kind of shapes this outer ring of sociocultural both perspectives, our desires for a better food system, or maybe we don't think about it at all, many people don't, and um, it just happens to come to them. So um, this is kind of the broad overview. We've got the supply and demand aspect, but a lot of these other, uh, we all understand that, of course, we require an, an environment <laughs> and we require uh, some level of um, ecological inputs for our food and um, that there's a lot going on here exchanging uh, resources, natural resources, but also money and waste as a concept. Everything goes also through industry. So industry can be the people developing the, um, the new uh, variety of soybeans or it can also be the people packaging up your food. It can be the ones um, out there making the, uh, the advertisements to get you to think more about buying Mac McDonald's and not to think about buying more broccoli, right? So there are people whose job it is to, to work on those people, but also systems, right? It's the system in place. Not necessarily an individual's fault if they work for a company that sells Roundup. It's also that they're a part of this, this larger system. So this is the basic elements, and I like to show that. And then there are the not so basic elements. Um, I'm not going to explain any of this figure, um, but it exists. You can Google it. And really, the point here is that it's complicated. There's a lot going on, right? Um, there's a lot happening in terms of uh, the, the systemic nature of the food system is what's so very interesting about it, is that, quote, everything is connected. But us as an individual, we are both at the mercy of and also we have an influence in our food system in many ways. So you can make a choice every day, often, hopefully, what you get to eat. Uh, but you, maybe you can't make a choice every day how that's grown. You can't make a choice every day how um, the people in charge of the policy making are telling our farmers what to do or helping our farmers with subsidies. Right? You're not necessarily making those choices, but you can have a sort of influence. Um, but again, it, it's, it's complicated. You, Part of what I also want us to get out of today is that it's not, it's not about you. It's not on you necessarily, though we have a lot of influence. We should remember that we're still important as an individual. It's a complicated system and there are many complicated things going on kind of behind the scenes. So if you want to get into the, the real specificities of all of this, just Google like food systems map and you'll see this. But the real, the real takeaway message here is that it's complicated, right, clearly. Um, again, I want your thoughts here. Why, moving from food systems in general and the complexities and the parts and the pieces and the technical knowledge, why are our food systems and agriculture often at the center of our debates around sustainability? This should be a low-hanging fruit question, pun intended. Because we eat every day. We eat every day, <laughs> sure. And why is that related to sustainability? Because it's a couple of billion people doing that every day, most likely three times. Mm -hmm. If we can. Yeah, mm -hmm. if we can. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The, the, the impact is huge. Right. Right. It's a big, I don't know, activity of our life. Yes. So impacts in terms of environment, mm -hmm. right? So sustainability often related to environmental impacts. We have billion, I don't know how many people we have now, eight, seven, seven billion. We have many people looking, seeking, wanting, eating food every day, and huge impacts, environmentally. Okay, why else? What else is, what, in our definitions of sustainability, any um, sustainability students in the room remember the three pillars of sustainability? Uh, economy, ecology, uh, social. Uh, social, social, cultural, exactly, yes. So. Um, why are food systems then at the center of economic sustainability debates? Any thoughts? Remember the logos of McDonald's? It's huge money. Big, big money. So of course, there's people on all sides of this debate thinking about why, how, how can we make more money, right? That's a huge part of, and our economies are are floated entirely almost on 
um, like agricultural production in many ways. And initially, the whole idea of economies came out of agricultural production, came out of being able to produce lots, sell, trade, barter, boom, economies. So yes, super important. And then culturally, of course, us being so many people, culturally, we all understand food is a very big deal. Perhaps some of you come from very um, food culture, like food is a very important part of your cultural background, and um, then maybe it's not. But you can understand that it's still a really important aspect for us to, to balance. So. Yes, we understand that food has huge impacts. And um, if we look at one framework called the planetary boundaries, which has been proposed by scientists and agreed upon widely as these global limits for our environmental impacts. And right now we are basically exceeding our planetary boundaries, the limits of the capacity of the planet to hold us by an atrocious amount. And on top of that, agriculture is one of the number one contributors to us surpassing these planet, the safe limits of our planetary boundary. So this gives us, this figure shows us within the green center what they've understood as the approximate safe planetary boundary for each of these, I believe, nine um, planetary boundaries. So climate change, um, ozone depletion, acidification, these are big words, biogeochemical flows, so that's the use of phosphorus and nitrogen, remember the NPK? That's right there, freshwater use, land use or land system change, so the ways in which our land is changing from non-agricultural to agricultural land or to human use land, agriculture is a leading cause of our land use change, as well as the number one cause of our biosphere integrity, so our loss of biodiversity. Um, yeah, so the little dotted areas, that's the role of agriculture in us pushing past these boundaries. So clearly, agriculture is a hugely important piece of, of the impacts on the planet. Um, particularly, it's just become so predominant in the last, I don't know, five decades that we can't do anything but change it, I think. Uh, and then if we look more specifically at some of these specific boundaries, if you look at climate change being related to global greenhouse gas emissions, which is our best estimate right now for environmental impact, of all global emissions, food is over a quarter, just about a quarter of all, of all global emissions. And you can see our major contributor to that is growing livestock, and land for livestock and crops for livestock. Um, another little piece of perspective, we probably, I feel bad often because I'm not from Finland, but I have to fly home and I think to myself, oh, all the carbon emissions of flying. But flying is only 2% of global emissions. Just feeding crops to animals is 6%, right? This is bananas, right? So we, we clearly have some changes that, that need to be made. Um, then, of course, there are different aspects of the food supply chain, the food system. I, I don't like to use the supply chain, but we're often thinking about it linearly, that food is grown, processed, packaged, retail, consumer, waste, blah. But along this system, there are places where there's more impacts than others. So, particularly up on top, you can see beef, uh, you, maybe you can't see, sorry, it's very small. Um, beef, lamb, cheese, um, beef from dairy cattle have fairly large impacts, and this is per kilogram of food product, so this is per unit weight mass, and most of this, most of the impacts are coming from land use change, that's conversion of the land from kind of what we would call, quote, natural to human use, and on, on farm, so production. Production is the biggest impact of all the food systems. So yes, your choice of what you buy in the supermarket is important, but not as important actually as how it's made. That's the real the real piece here. So, Question. yes please. What's up with olive oil and nuts? What is up with olive oil and nuts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so olive oil, um, if I don't fall over, olive oil's here, mm -hmm. and nuts here. So this says, nuts have a negative land use change figure because nut trees are currently replacing croplands, carbon is stored in the trees. So trees, or agroforestry, growing food on trees, actually stores carbon. So right now, in this model, it shows us a negative land use change value because it actually helps us to store carbon. Um, and olive oil, also doing the same thing, because olives grown on trees, right? So actually, uh, more diverse cropping systems that integrate uh, maybe grain crops with trees would actually be a, a way of integrating more um, carbon into the soil. 
So that's a good question. Um, also, most of the impacts of some of our um, less impactful products, like legumes and, and apples even, a lot of it comes from transportation. So uh, us to have for us to have apples year-round in the grocery store, uh, maybe they're, well, I don't know, they're from Chile or they're from, um, I don't know if they come from, where they come from, Spain, when they're here, um, a lot of the impact comes from transportation for those sorts of foods. Um, other questions? Kind of heavy. Not super fun stuff, but um, important. I have a question. Please. I'm just wondering, in, in Austria we have a lot of uh, organic uh, vegetables and fruits, much more than here, I think. And then we have, of course, local food or uh, fruits as well. Mm. So I'm always wondering what is the better choice mm. uh, to buy uh, organic food from let's say in our case it's mostly from Italy or Spain, mm -hmm. or by local food which is not grown organic? This is a tricky question, and um, I'm sorry to say I don't have a straight answer, of course. Uh, I'm a researcher, so we're not allowed to do that, but um, no, it, it's, the challenge is really um, in, it depends a lot on the food, it depends a lot on the food type. So there are some foods that it's actually much more efficient to be grown elsewhere and shipped in. Um, for example, hothouse tomatoes grown in Finland are locally are less uh, carbon efficient than the ones grown in Spain and sent here because they can transport those, particularly if you buy tinned tomatoes or already processed tomatoes. That's super efficient, right? That's growing tomatoes grown where they can grow really well, kind of a lot of low input, and actually at an economy of scale, so at a scale where the inputs are, are much more, are limited per individual tomato, individual can. So then buying that can of tomatoes in Finland is actually more carbon efficient. But then you, what if you want a fresh tomato, right? What if you want that organic, delicious tomato? Well, if you can find it, it's probably better to have something like that local than it is to have an organic tomato from Spain. Um, so uh, it's really tricky. And there's a lot for us to consider. And every day or every time we go into the store and we kind of make these decisions, we try to balance all this out. And remember I said how complicated it was? The, remember the take home is it's not about you necessarily. Like the choice is difficult, but it's not that you're given a lot of choices, right? So a lot of the power is not in your hands. And what, you, what power there is, we will learn hopefully in this course, is what we should take back and what we should leverage and use. But there are limits to that, and then when there are limits, then we can work to change it in other ways. So it's not necessarily, what I'm saying is not necessarily, should I buy this organic tomato from here or there? It's more like, how would we change the systems so that we're growing more things with less inputs? You know, it's a good, good question. Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't have a straight answer. Um, I wish it were that simple. <laughs> Um, okay, so I want to give us one more framework for thinking about systems. Um, it's called the socio-ecological systems thinking, and um, it is, as it proposes to be, uh, an ecological model that incorporates like socio-socio-cultural sides of systems. And um, these, it's, it's a it's a form of a frame of thinking about systems that helps us to incorporate the human aspect of things. So what we're focusing on particularly in this course is how we as individuals can also make some change. And this systemic nature helps us to understand these complex human nature. Now, you don't, we don't have to necessarily love this dualism, the human nature. We shouldn't actually necessarily separate ourselves. That's part of the challenge. Um, but it helps us to understand these, these complex systems. And um, understand where the boundaries are to these sorts of things. So I'd like us to use these. These socio-ecological systems are characterized by being complex, which we know the food system is complex. It's adaptive. It's adaptive in the ways that us as individuals, us as nation states, us as um, policymakers can be adaptive. We, need, we have a new product. We need to regulate it. We need to be safe. So we're adapting to the, the novelties and the complexities. And the food system does that, but per perhaps very slowly, depending. It's clearly linked. They're interactive, and it's dynamic, so it changes in many ways. So the, and, and there are feedback mechanisms that are also nonlinear. So this is just the way that these socio-ecological systems are characterized. 
and the, f the food system is one very good example of a socio-ecological system, this, type of this thing that is complex, adaptive, linked, all of these, all these aspects. So it gives us a frame. And to be a little bit more concrete, uh, this is an image of a socio-ecological system applied to um, food environment, or the, uh, you as an individual, what is around us, and what sorts of um, environmental factors influence our behaviors and our decisions as an individual. So we have, at the very micro level, many things that are at our interpersonal level. So this is our preferences, our knowledge, our ability to cook, our ability to go to the store, our ability to, to process this food, and, and our actually our attitudes, our self-efficacy, so our feeling of being able and capable of making these decisions. This is a really important part of you as an individual in your life, is that you understand that you actually do have the capacity or the power, and if you don't, then feeling having the self-confidence to seek out where to figure it out. Then there are the interpersonal pieces. This is your family structure, maybe um, your Aunt Karen can would never imagine being vegan, so you can't go go home and just have a meal with her, right? That's a, that's an interpersonal challenge or factor that influences our choices. Um, also, our relationships, of course, our social networks and peer groups. Perhaps we're all here because we're in a particular peer group that sort of facilitates this sort of um, supportive, sustainable, like forward forward thinking environment, um, but perhaps not. So that, that really um, influences us, as well as our setting and the policies. So the setting would be what retail services are available, what's available in your local canteen if you go to the canteen at work or at school. Um, we don't have a lot of influence on that necessarily, but this is still part of what influences our choice, right? And then, of course, the policies surrounding us, and um, there are many many aspects to that, from, from zoning, maybe where we're allowed to live, where we're allowed to grow food, um, what's served to us in school, the nutrition policy around what is good. So right now, the Finnish and most governments recommend that we have one to two glasses of milk a day, that we eat 10% of our plate, every plate, to have animal source food, that we eat half of our plate as vegetables and fruit, right? So this is actually something that maybe, if not directly, but kind of ideologically influences a lot of, of what is served to you, what is allowed to be served to you, and what our choices are. So there's a lot more influence in our system. So I wanted to give us this framing of a socio-ecological system so that we can start thinking about for ourselves what, which of these aspects we maybe do have control over, what we don't have control over, and where we can start to make um, individual kind of changes. So. Um, just at, at a larger level, we've all probably heard of the Sustainable Development Goals, perhaps these globally agreed upon goals for a better and more sustainable future. And food systems are, particularly sustainable food systems, are at the center of a lot of these goals. So this just lists out all of the many ways that, again, according to our three pillars of sustainability, food systems have the possibility for us to kind of address a lot of these goals for our planet in the future. And this is why food systems are again so central to a lot of these sustainability debates because we have, if you have a social sustainable, you have nurturing communities, economic, you have kind of prosperity and thriving communities, environmental of course preserving and protecting and, and allowing re resources to thrive, but any of those things separately isn't enough. We have to have all of them together which is what allows for us to have a sustainable food system. And yeah, just another visualization of how the Food and Agriculture Organization also promotes sustainable food systems as central to most of these um, 17 sustainable development goals. So it's, it's important in many different ways for us to sort of reach and change and make actual progress in food systems. Um, okay, I'm going to skip over this because this is boring and you don't need to know it. Um, Basically, what I want us to get to is to think a little bit more about our own food system, where we, maybe what we're embedded in at the different levels, and where you can start to define your own choices and, and activism and space within that, where you can find, building on your strengths and your passion and your interests, where, what you would want to do if you could make a change, from something very small to something very large. Um, and. What we're going to move into, uh, maybe after we have a break, is um, thinking about how to d develop our own kind of 
socio-ecological system for our own food system at our local level or personal level, or even if you're interested in global change at the global level. So um, I'm going to come back to this actually if we need and really just get us thinking about kind of diets and food choices. So my specific area of research is on sustainable diets, on sustainable diets and how we recommend them, how we frame them, how we think about them, and the also the actual particular aspect, what, which food items and in which amounts go into what makes a sustainable diet. So both the kind of conceptual, but also the technical side. What food is it and what should I choose when I'm at the grocery store? Um, this is a representation of the f what I theorized as the five domains of sustainable diets and some subcategories or subconcepts within those things to think about. So if you're thinking about your own personal choices, your own diet, what makes a sustainable diet, part of pulling out what um, changes you could yourself make if you're lo looking at changing your diets are looking at some of these concepts and some of these spheres. Maybe you're much more interested in the sociocultural and political sphere. So then you can focus more on animal welfare and rights. You can focus more on this food literacy, the consumer acceptance of more sustainable diets, right? So um, we can also come back to this. I can share this with you if you're interested in these specific. But this is actually based on a study looking at the as of 2020, the um, 16 countries in the world that had these national food guidelines that allowed or that incorporated sustainability or that had thought about and had framed sustainability within their national recommendations. So of the, what, some 200 uh, countries in the world, only 16 as of 2020 had incorporated sustainability consideration in their food guidelines, granted only about 180 of those countries even have uh, food guides. So still not very many, and of them, the things they pulled out most were almost entirely related to health and nutrition. So most of that is related to physical activity and um, healthy weight maintenance and water consumption, all important, but not sufficient by themselves to create a sustainable diet, right? It's not enough just to be thin and lean and active. Also cool, don't stop doing that, but it's not the system, it's not the rest of what's going on there. So what needs to be involved also is um, at a global and a local level this idea of food security and like agricultural practices that aren't negatively influencing the environment, of course, then all of the environment ecosystems aspects. The markets and value chains, super important. Maybe some of us are kind of um, economy haters. I know I myself am not really into the whole GDP thing and how we measure those, but it's still actually important because it's Im we're embedded in this system and until we burn it down and start over, this is what we have. So we have to deal with that in a way that helps us to move forward um, kind of holistically, right? We can't just say, well, I really reject any economic aspect, so I'm, I'm going to not deal with it, but we can't do that because all the rest of the world isn't living in our little like, fantasy of not having maybe the economy driving our decisions, because most of the rest of the world is. So it's something for us to think about. Um, okay, so with that, I'm gonna be done, and I'm gonna stop talking. Um, I just like some of these pictures. It's for you to think about where it is that you can yourself be an active person, whether that's with gardening, or cooking, or sharing your skills, or working with youth, working with other adults, working with older adults who need our help too. Um, and uh, then stop for now. <laughs>